with all those sites of action in mind, let's go back and talk about the respiratory effects of the opioids. And remember, this is sort of from acting on the brain stem where your um, respiratory centers are in the medulla. So basically two main effects. But what you'll see after giving someone a big dose is slow uh, and deep breaths. Slow breaths that are deep. So if we have just a sort of our normal respiratory pattern here, we give someone opioids, they'll get deep and slow. But not only do you change the pattern to being deeper and slower, but your overall minute ventilation is decreased. So you are moving less air and uh, ventilating less in every minute. So we'll draw the effects of minute ventilation on this graph here. Let's make the y-axis uh, minute ventilation, so vent uh, in liters per minute. And then your x-axis will be your PaCO2, or the concentration of CO2 in your arterial blood. Your PaCO2 should be about 40 because that's normal. And um, the normal minute ventilation to that is, is about 5 liters per minute. So that's probably where you're sitting right now. And if you were to hold your breath and let your PaCO2 creep up over time, you will increase your respiratory drive. So your minute ventilation will increase in order to um, try to lower your uh, PaCO2 back to 40. So that's with no opioids. When we give someone an opioid, what we're doing is shifting this Whole curve to the right. So instead of having the drive to breathe five liters per minute with a PC, PACO2 of 40, maybe you'll need a PACO2 of, of 60 um, in order to be breathing at five liters per minute. But if we just take a, a normal person into the operating room with a, a PACO2 of 40 and give them a huge dose of opioids, their PaCO2 isn't suddenly going to be 60, it's still going to be here. So let's draw this same curve and then extend it back down to where your PaCO2 would be 40. And actually, what we're seeing here is that we've given such a dose here that when this person's PaCO2 is still 40, they're down at zero. They have no drive to breathe at all. So we've actually made them apneic. What will happen for this patient then is that their end tidal CO2 or their, um, their PaCO2 uh, will creep up and with that then they will regain their drive to breathe. So maybe they'll settle out somewhere on this curve or they'll settle out back at this, at this point where they are still now breathing 5 liters a minute again but their PaCO2 is 60. Technically with very high doses this curve will also flatten out so not only will it be shifted to the right, but it will flatten. But let's just erase that because that gets a little bit too complicated and too messy for this diagram. Now let's imagine we've given someone an excessive dose of opioids. So we've shifted this curve even further to the right. Now, even with an excessively high PaCO2, like this is close to 70, they're not going to have any drive to breathe. They're sitting at a minute ventilation of zero. So this is someone who would stop breathing and then potentially not even restart breathing uh, to get enough oxygen to feed their brain. So this is someone who could end up with an anoxic brain injury um, from excessive respiratory depression. Of course, we can safely cause apnea in the OR because we have ventilators, but if this dose was given to someone on the ward, they would have problems and they would need something to reverse their um, opioid effects, so Narcan or an opioid antagonist. We'll go on to the cardiovascular effects of opioids, which I should say are pretty minimal on their own, but in conjunction with other anesthetic medications like volatiles or uh, propofol, you often will see decreases in the blood pressure, and this is why. So basically, you get vasodilation. And you can think of that as being from the sympathetic um, outflow decrease that you intentionally caused by giving someone an opioid. That will sort of in two ways decrease your blood pressure, both by decreasing your 
preload. So now all the venous capacitance beds are relaxed and you have less blood returning to your heart because it's all pooling in the extremities. Um, so normally, let's say that this is modeling tight venous vessels which are returning blood to your heart nicely, but then when you venodilate, you will have less uh, blood return to the heart. And then, so this will happen, the preload will be lower, and then you'll also get low after load to a degree, which is basically from relaxation or less uh, less arterial vasoconstriction. So um, let's just say that normally after after your aorta at, at end, or end organs, you're having a little bit of arterial constriction. Of course, not this, because this is coarctation, but this is just illustrating that you have tight um, tight vessels elsewhere, and then with your opioid, you have decreased that sympathetic vasoconstriction and decreased your afterload, so will cause low blood pressure. Opioids will also cause bradycardia at high doses. And this is from um, a direct stim of vagal nuclei. L E I in the brainstem. Some opioids like remifentanil also will have a direct effect on the heart. So they themselves will directly stimulate the heart to um, cause bradycardia. Just remember that these cardiovascular effects are, are relatively minimal. Um, and you can give quite a high dose of fentanyl before you really would would cause issues with the blood pressure. And actually, there is a ceiling effect too. So after a certain amount of opioid, you're really not going to further cause issues with um, hypotension. So they are relatively safe from that perspective.